find a time where the three of us could get together and have what I think what, what we were told was a, a pretty general discussion about, um, each of us would present something about uh, the way religious functions in our disciplines. And as I got it from Luna, uh, he told me that um, also having, you know, not just how it functions in your discipline, you know, philosophy, anthropology, history, but um, also my own you know, sort of relationship to religion in my teaching and whatever. So I'm going to have a, something to say about all those pretty quickly. So for, I, I teach philosophy, um, and I teach primarily um, contemporary European philosophy, but I also do a fair amount of work in the history of philosophy as well when you, when you, when you teach, um, you know, an introductory course is going to be pretty broad historically. And I'll just say, um, I'll say something about, I'm not going to take you through the entire history of philosophy, but I will sort of say that, um, that in philosophy and religion, uh, they're, they're sort of, uh, um, they're, there's some, the philosophy has a sort of vexed relationship with religion, because even from the start, um, if you look at Plato, maybe less so than the pre-Socratics, but um, philosophy is presented as something that is uh, kind of an antidote to kind of religious irrationalism. I mean, even in, even in, 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 in Plato, so that so Plato says, you know, look, these you know the various claims that come from these Homeric gods, they're all kind of nonsense. Let's see if we can sort them out rationally. So you, you find that in Plato, um, and um, you know, in, in Greek, Greek philosophy, for example, is come, often comes back to questions of God and, and religion, but generally, uh, generally, just God almost serves as a kind of um, function in the philosophical system, not an object of worship, not even an object of any kind of concern. So you get in, in Epicurus, for example, um, Hellenistic philosophy, you get the idea of like, sure, there are gods, um, but they have no concern with human beings, so we shouldn't have any concern with that. Like, you get that kind of claim, which isn't that un uncommon. Um, medieval philosophy, of course, uh, God played a huge role, and, and, um, um, and questions about the existence of God and the relationship of, of, um, of God to his is, I suppose, um, creatures, right? The relationship of God to the world was it a relationship of analogy, was it a relationship of univocity, etc. Were, were kind of the central core questions. Um, but um, medieval philosophy is, in, in, in contemporary colleges and universities, probably the least taught of all the periods in the history of philosophy. Um, for better or worse, there's some really amazingly fantastic stuff in medieval philosophy, but it's partly the contemporary college and university going back to philosophy's roots as really philosophy is quite different from religion. And um, that you know, brief period that, that uh, um, we sometimes call the dark ages or the middle ages, uh, well, it was pretty, you know, let's go back to where we, you know, let's go back to the period where, where philosophy really had nothing to do with religion. Now, if you find, if you look at a, like an introductory textbook on philosophy, like a, almost, Every, almost every such textbook is going to have a section on, you know, uh, philosophy of religion, philosophy and, you know, the, the proofs for the existence of God, whatever. But I always think that when I look at those things, I think that that's largely because philosophy is still pretty prominent in, you know, especially Catholic universities, and so um, that's sort of geared toward a particular kind of audience. But for the most part, I think um, uh, philosophers tend to um, steer clear of those kinds of questions of and to think of philosophy as about reason and about what can be demonstrated and proved. Now, there is a somewhat, I'm not sure this is the right word really, but there is a kind of mystical tradition in, in philosophy that runs through the history of philosophy. So you can think of a philosopher like Augustine, or a in, um, the medieval philosopher, uh, and, or, or a philosopher like Kierkegaard, um, um, or even a philosopher like Kant, for whom philosophical knowledge can only take you so far and after that, faith or something else is. So philosophy has inherent limits, or reason, knowledge has inherent limits, and beyond that is a domain of faith. So you get that in, in, a, in a philosopher like Augustine, and a philosopher like um, Kant, and a philosopher like Kierkegaard. These are pretty major figures. So I don't mean to suggest that philosophy totally has nothing to do with, with, um, with uh, God, religion, faith. Um, um, then you get also you also get figures like um, you know, uh, great early modern philosopher Spinoza, whose entire you know the opening chapter of his great magnificent book is on God, 
but it turns out that God and nature are the same thing, and so um, so maybe you can just dispense with the notion of God altogether. Um, so a couple more comments about the general things, and then I'll talk about my own relationship to this stuff. Um, for the most part, modern philosophy, modern, let's say, 19th, uh, 19th and 20th century philosophy has kind of dispensed with questions of God after those, you know, if you follow, following in, in, in the wake of, of um, thinkers like, you know, Darwin, of course, um, um, Marx, for whom religion is the opiate of the people, um, Nietzsche, for whom, as we know, God is dead, um, and, you know, Freud, for whom uh, God is, and, and religion is an illusion. That sort of set the course for 19th and 20th century of this European philosophy to kind of dispense with questions of religion. Um, you know, I do have to say, and we can talk about this later if you're interested, there has been something of a return to religion in uh, contemporary European philosophy. Um, in my own teaching, I often teach what could be called religious texts. Um, so, you know, I began the semester this, this in my tutorial teaching chapters of Genesis, and I've taught Genesis as a whole, as a whole body, too. Um, I've taught even the Christian Gospels, um, and you know, I've taught the Gospel of Matthew in particular, in, in various contexts. Um, I sometimes teach Taoist and Buddhist texts in courses in metaphysics. Um, I sometimes teach sections of the Upanishads. So I often teach those things in the context of placing them amidst other theories that they either compete with or are in dialogue with in various ways. I tend to teach these things as important cultural works, um, um, or as offering a, a sort of metaphysical position that I can kind of contrast with others. You know, I mean, I think this, this is true of all of us, I'm sure. We don't just teach what we believe in. We teach what we think is important. Some things that we don't believe in are really important, right? And so, um, I mean, just because I don't happen to believe it doesn't mean that it's not culturally, politically, socially, and religiously important. So, just quickly about my own, my own, um, in my own life and work, which is slightly separate from my teaching, right? Because in my teaching, I don't, it's not, I don't think it to be my job to be presenting my review. Um, that's not my job. Um, in my own work, I think I'm fairly to put a fine point on it, maybe too fine point on it, hostile to religion. <laughs> um, that is to any system of beliefs that. Um, that can claim the existence of something beyond nature, um, and that takes the kind of moral or spiritual guidance from that. Um, I, I, I don't believe in such a thing. I don't believe in any notion of soul, spirit, um, even mind, maybe. We can, we can talk about that. I don't believe that there's any, uh, any spiritual answer to the question of the meaning of life. Um, um, and I say that, and I'll just the briefest of biographical books. I say that as the, both the son and grandson of Lutheran ministers. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody who spent every Sunday of his life from age of, who knows, probably infancy through high school, um, uh, going to church, singing in church choirs, um, you know, going on sort of religious retreats. I went to a Catholic high school where, you know, I had to go to mass every Wednesday, and, you know, I went, you know, and so anyway. Um, I don't mean that that gives me license to then throw it all away. It just means to say I'm not totally ignorant of what I'm doing, but, um, and, um, I mean, I could, I could say more biographically, I won't say it now, but if it comes up, I might, uh, about what maybe turned me from that to my, my, what position I currently hold, but to my mind, and, and again, I'll, I think I'll just for the, for the sake of argument, maybe put a little bit too fine a point on it, and then we can talk about it, and I'll probably modify that a little bit, and you'll see that maybe I'm um, less of an asshole than I appear to be. <laughs> but, um, but it seems to me that, you know, it seems to me that, that religion, religious systems are, for the most part, not just only empirically false, but also, I think, often pernicious. Um, uh, and I think, I think it seems to me that we can understand the origins of religion as ways of explaining the world, um, as ways to bolster certain kinds of identities, you know, identities of particular peoples, um, as psychologically beneficial. We can understand all that, and yet also see them as false and not very good. Um, just because something helps you, you know, psychologically doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's, it's good or it's true. It seems to me that there are better scientific 
psychological, you know, philosophical explanations for all the things that, that, that religion, and I'm using that term probably too broadly, um, can explain to us. Uh, and the sectarian functions of religion, I find really, again, quite pernicious. About that too. Um, and as I said, the psychological reasons for investing ourselves in religious traditions might be beneficial to us, might help us, but it doesn't necessarily make them true. So anyway, I'm going to stop there. This is true. Um, so in Jim and we can take some of these things up in our conversation. So, so. Oh, you're setting up so well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Um, in ways that I would never would have imagined. Um, so I, I, as Tanner said, I'm just in Arlington and I teach anthropology and Asian studies um, in the School of Critical Social Inquiry, CSI. Um, and I was hired to teach anthropology of religion of South or Southeast Asia, and um, I, I backed into that. And <clears throat> I was attracted to anthropology first, and then began to realize that because I was interested in working in Southeast Asia, that I needed to know something about Buddhism and to understand something about Buddhism in people's lives, <clears throat> which led me into to the anthropology of religion as a subfield of anthropology. And anthropology is the study of people, and social anthropology is really how people live their lives, how people make sense of, of their lives, and then just <clears throat> interact on a day-to-day basis. And anthropologists, and, and closely aligned with sociologists, have spent a lot of time since uh, it's a much younger set of fields <laughs> since the, the mid 1800s debating these kinds of issues of what role anthropology or what role religion plays in people's lives. <clears throat> why do why do people have religion? And I I approach it primarily not from a philosophical point of view, but what is how is is religion lived? And what meanings does it carry, and how does it influence how people move through their daily lives? So you get a strong influence from me, in my thinking in particular, from two sociologists at the turn of the 20th century, Max Weber and Emil Durkheim, who had big debates about the role of religion in society. Weber is best known for um, his, the spirit of the spirit of the Protestant, Protestant, Protestant the ethic of capitalism, right? Um, and showing how how Protestantism is very closely aligned and, and setting up a capitalist system. Um, I encountered him in classes on South and Southeast Asia, and he wrote a book about the religions of India in which he basically said that the Buddhism is so otherworldly that Buddhist countries can never develop. Mm -hmm economically. And having been in Thailand in high school, and one of my driving questions was, why is the city of Bangkok growing so fast? And I'm thinking, yeah, these people are very much see themselves as Buddhists. And so Weber became my foil. Why do you think Christianity, Protestantism specifically, provided this motivation? And why did he think something like Buddhism or Hinduism did not, and that led me to start looking at Buddhist monks in Thailand who do rural development work based on their interpretations of Buddhism. Uh, but that's only one way of looking at religion and anthropology. So you also have uh, a lot of thinkers who approach it functionally. What function does it provide in society? <coughs> Um, structurally, particularly Levi Strauss, Claude Levi Strauss, a French anthropologist, who really saw religion as part of the way the brain is structured and the meanings then that it gives to how people categorize things in their lives and that provides the social structure for their lives. Um, symbolism, people like Clifford Gertz and Sherry Ortner, who are trying to see the meaning that religion has in, life, in, in people's lives, as well as other things that have meaning in people's lives. But all of these keep coming back to then how do people live day to day? And how do these things influence them day to day? And I, I'm most fascinated by how 
religion intersects with other aspects of society, so economics, politics, gender relations, psychology, environment, and that's my current strongest thing is looking at Buddhist monks in Thailand who do environmental work based on Buddhism. So how do they understand nature very differently from the way you're talking, you were talking about nature. Um, and how do they, maybe not so different, maybe not so different. Um, how some of the <coughs> thinkers work. Um, but the, how, does, how does Buddhism provide them with uh, the ethics to treat the environment a certain way, but also to treat the people who have to live in the environment in certain ways. Um, so I've spent a lot of time looking at the different interpretations, the, the, the contradictions that appear in the way people live their lives and the, what the, the formal scriptures teach. Um, and just as an example, um, I was telling Adrian earlier, just, just shortly ago about what happened in my Buddhist economics class that I'm team teaching with an economics professor this semester, which is a blast. Um, that I started talking about in the general introduction to, to Buddhism in society, and I and somebody asked a question, and, and I can't remember the question, but my response was to talk about Zen monks in Japan who, during World War II, were, were very supportive of the war effort, the nationalist Japanese war effort, and even sometimes joining the army. And this really flipped out some of the students who said, but that goes against the basic teachings of Buddhism. But not necessarily from those people's point of view. And, and I went on to show some other examples, the monks who, in southern Thailand, who are armed in, in fighting against Muslims in southern Thailand. And the students were, some of the students were getting very, very upset about this, but that's, but that's not Buddhism, that's not real Buddhism. <laughs> and and um, a couple of students countered saying, well, you know, well, how is this different from something like the Crusades with Christianity, which Christianity teaches peace and love thy neighbor, et cetera, et cetera, and yet it can be used to, to justify war as well. And, and yet people were like, well, that's Christianity, but Buddhism, Buddhism is different. <laughs> and it, it made me realize that I think in our society, or maybe in, among college students perhaps, or perhaps just in the valley, there, there's an idealization of Buddhism that doesn't always occur to more familiar religions like Christianity and, and Judaism in particular, that there's an expectation that it's going to be perfect. And, and yet if you looked at it as a lived religion on the ground, then none of these religions are the same as what they teach. Those are the ideals that you strive for. That's, that's the image. But then well, humans are pretty messy. Right? Humans are, are quite messy. Um, so, so that's what I think anthropology is trying to, to figure out the messiness of it. And another area I find myself walking in is, is because I spend so much time looking at Buddhism in society, I also affiliate very closely with the Buddhist studies folks from a religious studies perspective in the valley. There's a five college Buddhist studies group, a uh, very strong program, and, and I'm considered part of that. So I'm walking this line between anthropologists studying how this is played out in people's lives and then teaching it as, as teaching the religion, not teaching it as like a, a monk would be teaching it, but the study of Buddhism itself. And here's where you, you set up a really nice question when, Christoph, when you commented about we don't always teach what we believe, right? We're going to teach things in a well-rounded way and you've got to give lots of different viewpoints. Um, several years ago, in 2005, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama came to speak at Smith, sponsored by Smith in Hampshire, there, in addition to the big public talk he gave in the afternoon, there was a seminar for the Buddhist studies folks. So there were about 30 faculty, obviously not just from the five colleges, but from the surrounding area as well, and about 35 students who were enrolled in the Buddhist studies certificate program. And there was quite a discussion about what the topic of the seminar should be. And what was decided on, and I don't know quite by whom, was do you have to be Buddhist 
to teach Buddhist studies. And as an anthropologist, that, that I'm not Buddhist. I mean, I think Buddhism appeals to me in a lot of ways, but I think it would be false to say I'm a practicing Buddhist. I, that's a complicated question, but does that mean I then don't understand it, that I can't convey things about it? But sitting around that table with all these different scholars and with His Holiness, the gist from the Buddhist studies folks was, yeah, you do. And I'm, and I'm curious, I'll throw this out to anybody, you guys or anybody else in the room, do people ask that question when somebody teaches about Christianity? Judaism in, a, in an academic setting. But they always ask it about Buddhism. I, I get frequently asked by my students, are you Buddhist? As if that's going to impart a, yeah, it would be a different set of qualifications. But it's a very interesting tension that I think anthropologists face a lot with that kind of question. And yet, if I went off to study Australian Aborigines, nobody would ask me if I believed in the Aboriginal animism, <laughs> before they asked me if I was qualified to teach it, if that's where my field work was based, right? But why are they asking about Buddhism? So it's just a, a question to throw out there um, that, I, that I wrestle with and, and face quite, a, quite often, that steps, you know, you've got the anthropology of religion and then you've got all these different subfields within it, different approaches within it, and in this particular focus, there's a there's an interesting tension in itself. So I think I'll leave probably there so we have time for discussion okay. after just give me a second to plug myself in here. Hold this down. Thank you. <laughs> Historian of modern Europe, but it's interesting to see that despite our different fields, we're asking the same kind of questions or teaching things the same way, I think. Uh, so, uh, modern Europe for me means 18th century to the present, roughly, but I dabble a lot in medieval and, and Renaissance history, and that takes me into more dealing with religion, I think. Uh, let me just start by saying then that history is for me really both a calling and a career. It's a labor of love, the means by which I earn my bread by the sweat of my brow. Uh, I was delighted, of course, to accept the invitation to come here because I know we may not all see eye to eye <laughs> about the specifics, and I'm not going to put words in anybody's mouth, but I think we all believe religion is crucial to other things that we study and teach. Uh, to try as I might, I couldn't keep up. I, this topic really became a thorn in my flesh. I couldn't think of what I was going to say. <laughs> so I was sitting there last night, and I said, said to myself, you know, what was me? <laughs> Anything I say here won't be more than a drop in the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> and I was first really my wits end. I was about to give up the ghost. Because <laughs> after all, when you procrastinate, you read what you sell. <laughs> but finally, yesterday, I realized the handwriting was on the wall, <coughs> and I had to make a decision, so by the skin of my teeth, uh, I managed to cobble something together between preparing classes and other discussion group because there was no rest for the wicked. Uh, so I thought I'd stick to straight and narrow and basically just tell you what historians do when they talk about religion. Uh, but, and in the beginning was the word. <laughs> All of these, you can tell, come from the King James Bible. And there's a point there. Uh, the point I wanted to make about that was that you can derive two things, I think, from the example. It's about cultural literacy in a certain sense. You know all those phrases, but you may not know where they come from. Sometimes it matters to know where they come from, you know the context, you know the literary traditions, textual traditions, and so forth. Uh, it's also about cultural history in the sense of the study of culture. And I apologize for a little trouble speaking because of the little head injury and some dental surgery. Uh, so the second thing I think I would say is cultural history is a field. Uh, again, in line with what Christoph and Sue were saying, religion shapes the way people look at the world. So if you want to understand what makes, what makes people tick, you've got to understand their beliefs. And that's part of it too. Uh, I, mean, I think the gap extends beyond just a stock of illusions or a different mentality. I mean, you have to realize that people really do, you know, people in some sense historically were like us, and in some sense very different from us. And Mark Bloch was a great medievalist, talking about history as a science of men in time, human beings in time, you might say nowadays. But in other words, that how does the human species react in a different context? 
culturally, chronologically, geographically, and so forth. Uh, so both tasks are important. Uh, the, the starting point, though, that makes it so difficult, and again, picking up where Christoph began, is that we live in a very secular world. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, talked about this. You know, he says, basically, we don't ask questions about God anymore in our, in our explorations of philosophy, science, and art. To me, that's a good thing, probably, because religion has no explanatory power in my field. If you tell me something happened because God willed it, I give you an F. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Uh, people didn't always think this way, though. Uh, people did believe in religions, and they believed in absolute truths. You know, none of us heard the minister at the First Congregational Church talk about many ways to God, and the word God is so small, it's not just, well, sorry, you know, they burned you with steak of that until fairly recently. So, uh, you know, if you want to understand the past, you have to understand that people believed in absolute truth, that there were ways to truth, and that usually one of them was true and the rest were wrong. It wasn't any kind of multicultural, ecumenical paradise. Uh, that's simply a reality. We don't have to agree with that, obviously, but that was the way people lived their lives. Uh, the other thing is that they organized the world accordingly. So, for example, uh, between the Middle Ages and the French Revolution, people spoke about society in Europe being organized along the lines of the three orders. What does that mean? Or three estates, we talk about it. Remember French Revolutionary history. Uh, the average student, or some of my colleagues no longer with us, fortunately, uh, would think the first estate was the aristocracy. Well, no, because we think of power, military power, wealth. No, it was the clergy, because the world is created by God. God is responsible for the social order. The church, in the person of the pope, is the vicar of Christ on earth. The church provides morality and saves our souls. So beneath them come the aristocrats, the knights, who ensure society and justice will be maintained, uh, personal security, prosperity, and so forth. And then down below that, the 98, or nowadays we'd say 99% of us, who do all the work. And so they would say those who pray, those who fight, those who prop and plow. That's the way the world makes sense to them. And they continue to adhere to that notion, even though the world was way out of whack with that. So in the French Revolution, when the three estates convene, they're supposed to vote, vote by estates on the budget crisis. Each estate gets one vote. Well, two estates had about 2% of the population, and one had 98. The third estate said, wait, this isn't quite fair, and you get a revolution. So you know, that's, things start to change then. Uh, but that's the, that's the point about ideology and the way we see the world. Uh, it's, it's a way of organizing reality. The other thing is that religion was, uh, as one of my Renaissance historians said, uh, everywhere. In other words, ubiquity and propinquity, religion is everywhere and it's very close. You know, so if you were born in a parish that's where your family lived, your birth is recorded in a parish register, you're baptized by a priest, you're confirmed by the priest, you get married, you're buried in a churchyard. You know, if you wanted to do certain things in life, like learn a trade, you join the guild, which is a religious organization with a patron saint and have religious holidays. You might have to look for religious work for certain matters. You know, so the church was everywhere. Religion was everywhere. The art was religious. It was public art. It was there in the church. It was there in the town square and so forth. So it's just a very different world. It was a religion-saturated world. In some ways, people talked about there being too much religious activity. Here, not, not activity, but the sense that people attached too much symbolism sometimes to things. Uh, famous example of the medieval saint who cut the apple into three pieces for the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, but sometimes when baby Jesus was in the womb, he cut into four pieces and he peeled the skin because Jesus didn't eat the skin of the apple. And, you know, that's, that's either a very touching form of mystical piety or it's just taking things too far, as some historians said. But that's the kind of the world, uh, the world that they lived in. Uh, we could think also of the larger cultural legacy. What did religion do for us? It gave us the book form as we know it. Uh, one of the things, you know, the codex is a fancy word for book with leaves or pages, which we all have nowadays, except when we use our digital media. Uh, but that came in the first century of the Common Era, and it's very much, it came from the Roman culture, but it was very much associated with Christianity. One of the things Christianity does is favor the codex over the scroll, which is pagan, Roman, or Jewish, or Greek, or what have you. Also, it with different types of reading, where you can move back and forth and find things. But, you know, that's one example. Preservation of knowledge. Uh, the monastery preserved knowledge by copying manuscripts and creating new knowledge. Uh, we also had uh, recovery of classical knowledge through Islam, for example. Greek philosophy became up and progressed through Islam in Arabic or through Arabic, then Latin, Hebrew, what have you. Uh, here's an example of a book that was written by the Hebrew poet Yehuda Halevi in Spain in the 12th century. Uh, it's called the Kuzari. It's about a dialogue between a, a pagan barbarian who brings before him a Jewish, Christian, and Muslim wise man, and a pagan Greek philosopher, and he wants them to explain what the best religion is. This is an 18th century tradition for the same thing. So we do these traditions of cultural dialogue and transmission. Even as people disagreed, there was interchange and cross fertilization. 
Uh, just very briefly, as we move towards the ending here, some things I do in my classes. Uh, you know, here's a book that I use about women and food and middle ages. The point the author makes is that we tend to think sometimes that people again were like us, and they weren't. So we value money, sex, power, right? Uh, she makes the point in the, in, the, in the middle ages when there was scarcity, food was more important. You know, giving food was an act of charity, withholding food was an act of cruelty. And women, of course, are associated with food through milk and through mothering. Well, so is Jesus, because you eat and drink his, you drink his, you drink his blood and his body in communion. And she talks about the way that women found a kind of agency, even in a male-dominated religion. They carved out their own spiritual space and a space within the institutions. Uh, so it helps us to see the Middle Ages in a different way. You know, it doesn't reduce women simply to victims of a chauvinistic patriarchal religion. Uh, we talked about anti-Jews and anti-Semitism. So, for example, uh, students nowadays often say, you know, what, this was a terrible violation of human rights, or people were prejudiced. And I would say no, because those are modern categories. You know, people hated the Jews because they were sinful and evil in the eyes of the church. In other words, they had killed Christ. They were being punished for that by being exiled from their land, forced to live, scattered throughout the world in a state of humility. They were supposed to be humiliated but not killed. And that was a witness. This is what happens to those who betray God. You know, so it's a very theological reason. Uh, and the crusaders, as one historian said, the crusaders killed Jews for what they were, not for what they imagined they were. Later you get weird fantasies about well poisoning and magic and devils and things like that. But the point is here that, you know, if you're living in a world in which people believe in religious absolutes, they're going to make these kind of categorizations sometimes. So it doesn't make prejudice or discrimination or violence any better or worse, but it's historically different than modern prejudice. So that's something you want to think about when you're talking about things. Uh, another book I use is about money and religion and, and charging of interest. Uh, and most of the money lenders in the Middle Ages were not Jewish, they were Christians, but they bankers were eventually Christians too. But the point the author wants to make is that you know, this wasn't seen by us like a social issue so much, you know, Wall Street versus the rest of us. It was a theological issue partly because there are sins, the sin of greed, the sin of desire for money and so forth. But also, the way they, they, they didn't like interest, not only because the Bible said you can't charge interest, but because they couldn't wrap their heads around it because they had a notion of productivity. You, money means you earn something, right? I work, I get something. Money that makes money, they couldn't get their heads around. You know, money in a bank account that produces more money, it, and it works 24 hours a day. And that's sinful, there's no Sabbath. And so really, <laughs> no, seriously. And so, and, and the user was a thief of time, and time belongs to God. So, you know, there's a very theological way of looking at money. And part of what he talks about is how, as society needed money and capitalism, they had to find ways to reconcile this. How can we allow banking? How can we have commerce? Or distinguish between good commerce and bad banking, things like that. In other words, how religious values shape our social institutions and policies. A uh, book about the Dutch. Uh, here the author makes the point that the Dutch, especially the Dutch Calvinists, uh, these Protestants, you know, they really saw themselves in a biblical tradition as the heirs of the children of Israel. They fought the floods the way the Egyptians, uh, the way the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea on dry land and so forth. You know, the Spanish became like the Egyptian pharaoh, their oppressors, and they built up this whole view, but also they believed in sin and punishment. So, for example, that's what the title talks about. You know, in Calvinism, as, as Sue was saying, there's a notion that there is some kind of, now, unlike the Middle Ages, there's a reward for earthly activity. It's good to have a calling or an occupation. Making money might be a good thing. It might be a sign of God's favor. But, you know, how do you know if you're, where's the dividing line between God's favor and evil luxury, you know, between comfort and working hard and enjoying the fruits of it? or being spoiled and greedy and selfish. And so they live in a state of perpetual psychological tension. You know, is our prosperity a sign of God's favor? Or is it God's temptation? Is he going to destroy us? So a very fascinating way of looking at the rise of capitalism in early modern Europe tied into religion. Uh, did a book about the Tobins in this class. I don't religion in material led too. You know, the Tobins and Puritans have a bad reputation, but they were actually kind of interesting people. They wore colorful clothes. They drank a lot of beer. Uh, not at all these people wearing, you know, all black clothes or buckles all over the place. Uh, uh, they, did, they did believe in God, the Commonwealth, so they tried to organize their lives accordingly. You know, and one reason that the Dutch and, and the American Puritans went back to the Hebrew Bible rather than the Christian one is because that was a book about society. It's about laws and rules, how you do certain things, how you regulate organizations, get along with other people, not so much about salvation in heaven. So they looked back to that. Uh, they also had premarital sex, and quite a bit of it. Uh, which might surprise you. This was true throughout Europe. People had sex, they got pregnant, and the main, the main concern of the church or the secular authorities was to place people. You know, there shouldn't be any loose ends. So if the couple got married, that was fine. 
you know, if you believe in a human nature that's fundamentally sinful and evil and tempted by all sorts of worldly pleasures, it stands to reason that people are going to get pregnant. Uh, so they, they cope with that too. Again, quite different from the stereotype of the great Puritans. And we can talk about the Puritans in England who overthrew the king, cut off his hat, and set up the Democratic Republic. So lots of religious legacies. Uh, by the time we get to the 19th and 20th centuries, when we're talking mostly about a secularized Christianity that's become appropriated. So here, for example, uh, I was talking about class today about the First World War. How do you cope with 13 million dead? How do you find meaning in the slaughter of machine guns and poison gas and artillery? Uh, sacrifice for the nation, you know? Or the nation becomes like Christ. And here this talks about the soldiers, you died so that we could live. You know, the Christian imagery is transported directly into the political realm. Uh, then we have our friend Karl Marx, you know, as you mentioned, things get secularized. People like Marx, Weber, uh, Darwin, Nietzsche are talking about religion as not being important. But this is very interesting that, you know, if you turn to capital, you find frequently Marx, Marx is talking about religion. You know, he starts off the religious passage very often when talking about economics. And as one literary critic has said, you know, it serves multiple purposes. Uh, it shows, for example, that religion and capitalism are connected, connected for Marx. It suggests a kind of hypocrisy, too, uh, 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 an unhealthy greed. And he kind of makes, he makes fun at the end also of religious language, you know, this accumulate, accumulate, sort of religious diction. It's like a prophet. So he's really using a passage like this to underscore the complexity of religious tradition in society. I would say, if I had to make one critique as I wrap up here of what we historians do, is that we stop talking about religion, about religion around this time. You know, once Darwin and Marx and Nietzsche have killed the beast, we're through with it. Uh, no, seriously, so uh, the problem is that religion drops out of the textbooks. It makes sense in the Middle Ages, as Christoph said with philosophy, when they thought about religion all the time and religion played a big role. But in the 20th century, not so much. And I think that's a mistake. You know, we don't even talk about popular religion. It, it pops up when there's a crisis or a miracle or the Pope makes a statement about a social issue. But we should really think about talking about religion in the larger context of history, too. Uh, anyway. This was a famous, famous ad campaign of the 1960s. They had this one in Native American and a whole bunch of other people. And we can use that for our purposes, I think. So. And the final thing, of course, not just for stupid people. fellow student from China, he recently decided to become Christian. And uh, that's a quite common phenomenon for Chinese students mm -hmm. coming to the U.S. because they see the kind of campus culture and is so disillusioned with kind of ethical standard. Really? So they seek shelter sometimes uh, and church embrace them. They very actively mm -hmm. pursue them. So do you think um, in that way the universities are implicitly pushing those students um, coming from tradition or coming from uh, different culture to the um, embrace of God. And the Chinese church make really good dumplings and <laughs> use that to entice many students to go to their uh, events. <laughs> but, also, but also I imagine it's also, uh, I mean, it's like so much of what religion means to people. It's a community, right? I mean, it's, it's not just joining a religion, it's joining a community. that has a lot to do with it. And I, I've seen in Southeast Asia there's an interesting tension um, in, in Burma, where when the British colonized Burma, they also brought Christianity. And there were a number of missions, including American missions, mm -hmm. who were piggybacked with the, with the British. And they spent a lot of time, a lot of time, proselytizing among the Buddhist Burmans, the ethnic Burmans who were primarily Buddhist. And they, they were pretty unsuccessful. And there's one missionary in particular from Boston, uh, his name is Steve Sterry, and that starts with the J, John, not Johnson, I'll think of it eventually. But he spent 20 some years trying to, to convert the Buddhist Burmans and in the Rangoon area and absolutely unsuccessful. And then he went out to uh, 
more remote area where it's ethnic minorities, and there's a lot of tension historically between the ethnic minorities and the, the, the ethnic Burmans who were the dominant group. And a lot of the ethnic minorities started to convert very quickly. And one explanation that I've heard some of these, the, the, the descendants of some of these people that converted was that they converted to Christianity because they saw that would help them get the British as allies against the mm. Buddhist <clears throat> Burmans. Mm. And so it wasn't really for the religion that it offered as the social context. Mm. Although now, some of these people that I know, are very, they are very religious in, in how they live their lives. But the reasons for becoming might have been much more social. So I would think you know, there's, all, there's going to be all kinds of reasons why yeah. the students coming from China to here might be converted. He, uh, and he, when he explained why he decided to convert, he quoted an example when he was in China and a young teacher was teaching evolution and he asked a question and the teacher yelled at him and said, oh, you're making trouble, shut up, just uh, memorize. And so he <laughs> felt so much revenge and now some, finally he's in a camp where people believe that Darwin is, uh, like, uh, don't believe in evolution. So. <laughs> Those of us have prompted for evolution. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it is, it's an interesting question that I always think about too because most of us tend to be pretty secular or irreligious or whatever, not really just by the common standards. And the university, I mean, the, the academic life as a whole around the country. I remember at one point we had a colleague here and she said, God, Hampshire is a godless place. You know, just, <laughs> great, I mean, you know because she felt offended because people, you can, you can talk to spares about, about religion. Well, maybe some religions, not all, but most. Uh, religion in general, with you know, with with impunity, whereas other kinds of prejudice are very, uh, you know, we're very alert about that. But I think it's very common for academics to think that religion is for stupid people, and to look down upon them, and to make judgments of a sort we wouldn't make otherwise. And you know, in a sense, it's our right to make judgments because we're not here to teach religion or support religion. We're here to teach our scholarship uh, according to modern scientific standards. But still, uh, it, it it can be, I think, a problematic atmosphere. Uh, if, or if religious students feel unwelcome here, or if they're not being taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think that's why it took, you know, I think all of us made the claim that, um, that, you know, despite my own personal philosophical or even scholarly positions about religion, um, I, think, I think I'm able, and I think all of us are <coughs> able to teach things, you know, um, uh, the biblical texts I teach are important, mm -hmm. and and they're not so. And and whatever my feelings about them, they're not so dumb as to uh, not warrant reading. You know, I mean, they're hugely hugely important, and and um, I think students around here are much more inclined to dismiss, you know, um, texts from the Hebrew and Christian Bibles, for example, than they are to just to, than to you know if if you propose. Uh, 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 Hindu or Buddhist texts right. that are much more likely to sort of take seriously. But I want to sort of say, no, look, this is like, Absolutely. read Genesis carefully. It's really tricky and hugely interesting mm -hmm. as poetry, as, 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 you know, as, uh, you know, cosmology, as everything. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, the, at the end of the day, do you believe it? No, but I, I, I'm not a Platonist either. And yet I think, you, can, I'm, you know, I'm not a Platonist, I'm not a Cartesian, I'm not a whatever. And yet, of course, you have to teach that stuff. So, I mean, I guess my hope would be that um, that if you ask me personally, yes, I'm a godless heathen. But, uh, but, but, but in my classes, you wouldn't feel like a, you're being berated by a godless heathen. <laughs> I want to convert some of the evangelical Christianity totally by accident. I don't know how I do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a bunch of fascists too, so I mean, yeah. oh. <laughs> you have to be careful to teach too enthusiastically. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's true. It's yeah. I guess I'm interested in your question about does your religion matter when you're teaching? Um, have you noticed a sort of flipped in reverse that your students tend to have a specific religion coming into, into class? or? Mm. No, I, and I think, I mean, there's always some. There's always some students who, for example, in the classes on Buddhism are, yeah. are Buddhist, whether they, were, whether they were raised up in a Buddhist family or a Buddhist society. Um, 
or because they are converts. But you, all, I would say, a lot come because they're they're curious, they're interested, they're they want to understand something that they may have been very superficially exposed to, and, and try to unpack it much more. Um, and and definitely some who've converted since they've been here. Not I'm not saying for my classes, so I'm not going to make that claim. <laughs> but um, you know who for various reasons have been exposed and they're thinking, they're questioning. And we're all in academia, we are questioning things and searching for answers. Well, the kinds of answers we're searching for may be very different for some people than for others. Um, that said, I do, the, some of the classes I haven't taught recently and I need to get back into the rotation somehow, sometime soon. For example, a class that I, I taught my very first semester here and, and several times called Religious Movements and Social Change. Mm. And um, in this class, among other things, we, look, we looked a lot at the beginning of Christianity and how it evolved from a radical challenge to, a, to the status quo and to something that became very, very institutionalized and, and what were some of the processes that go and how that pattern is, is repeated with other religions as they develop and change and, and then split and go in different directions. And um, at one point during the semester, I usually touch on liberation theology as, as it's practiced in Central America in particular. And uh, the first semester I taught it, I, I showed a film by Bill Moyers that was looking at, I think it was El Salvador, and he was looking at the role of liberation theology, the, the Catholics who were using liberation theology to try to change society and, and help the poor and help with social justice. And so he was interviewing a, a, an advocate, an activist American who was in El Salvador doing this. And then he interviewed an evangelical uh, missionary who also from the United States who was in El Salvador. And the way he presented the second person was not very kind. And the students started laughing at, at not at the way he was presenting, but at this man himself and the kinds of things he was saying and the way he was approaching. And <clears throat> I don't know if it was that day or the next day, I had a, a student who, in my class, who had started in Hampshire, taken seven years off in the middle of her did two, <clears throat> had become born again, and then was returning to Hampshire to finish her degree and including religious studies from an anthropological perspective as part of it, and saw my class was like, oh my god, that's exactly what I want to take. And she was, as you can imagine, quite upset <clears throat> about the reaction of the other students in the class to the film. And, and this immediate judging that was going on. And it was really interesting because I, I really was grateful to her for coming and telling me this and realizing how I need to preface. I can make no assumptions about who's in the room. And to preface, one of the things I believe from anthropology is you want to be respectful of everybody and everybody's perspective. Whatever it is, even if you completely disagree with it um, or you don't understand it, that's what you want to move towards is understanding it. And so every time I've taught that class since, there's a lot of discussion about respect and understanding and trying to trying to get inside people's heads and see it from their point of view. It's called the emic perspective as opposed to the edic perspective, which is from the outside or trying to analyze somebody else. And you want to understand it from their point of view so that you can, you can be respectful of it and see how it motivates people. And you know, this evangelical missionary in this film, his intentions were extremely good. He wanted what he believed was the absolute best for these people. It's just that what he wanted and the way he went about it was very different from one, Bill Moyers, and two, most of the people in the classroom watching the film. But not everybody. Right? So there's this one woman who really thought, yes, that's the way you do social change. That's how you help people. It's for this eternal question. And, and that was a really important lesson for me in terms of thinking about what are my students bringing into the classroom? Right? 
when they're when you're studying religion. So. Okay. Um, I have a question in reference to uh, this whole environment that Hanford faces on religion and religiousness. And my question is, do we really feel like there's a place for religious studies at Hampshire? And is like, how can we change the dialogue regarding religiousness? Because I, I, I'm taking a class now with Alan. It's uh, World Religions, and we started with the Torah moving into um, the Christian Bible. And they, the way that Hampshire students approach religiousness is, I would say, very judgmental and disrespectful in some regards to other students. And they were just kind of like, there's a difference between coming at it from an academic standpoint and like um, analyzing the literature, like Bible or the Torah as a literature, and then also coming at it from a very malicious, judgmental standpoint. And I feel like um, people were just really shredding it apart and like like just disrespecting it. Like, and I I just I'm curious, like how can we have that dialogue with people at Hampshire when? People do say that, like, this is a godless place. <clears throat> There's a history. There, there is an interesting history, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> at Ham about Hampshire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was hired a little over 22 years ago as a compromise um, <coughs> because the one of, one professor, there was really only one professor who, who, who explicitly was teaching about religion at that point in time and, and primarily uh, Christianity. And so many students were coming to him, and he finally said, unless you hire somebody else, I'm not going to do this anymore. And just stopped working with those students, which led to a lot of pressure. And so there was a, a, a negotiation. There was an anthropology position open, and it became anthropology of religion. Mm -hmm. right. But even at that point in time, there was still a lot of resistance in the faculty and the administration to the teaching of religion. Because I think it's partly because there's a there was a core of people who ha have a strong Marxist background that they were bringing to the way they, they think about teaching, and had difficulty separating the teaching about religion, religious studies, from proselytization. And um, I mean, just the fact that you're in Alan Hodder's class is already showing the changes. Going in a much better direction. We have a long way to go. The, the what you're describing and what I, did, I experienced 20 some years ago with this other student um, is a little distressing, and we still have a long way to go with that dialogue. But you know, we have, through various reasons, been been able to begin to hire somebody like Alan Hodder, and then hire Alan uh, Ryan Jew in Asian religion, and begin to make this more a part of the curriculum as a field of study, along with philosophy and anthropology and history and other ways of looking at it, and, and stepping away from, um, from like when I came, there was a couple of anthropologists, sociologists, and you know, <laughs> historians that were the ones who were teaching about religion, <laughs> and, and not religious studies people. Mm -hmm. the, um I mean, I think Bob Maher tells the story about how, how Robert Thurman, who was a Amherst, right, major who studies scholar, um, also Uma's dad, but um, uh, was going to set up this like center at, at Hampshire. He was going to get his library. Too. Yeah, he was, and he was, and 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 apparently the Hampshire students, maybe faculty too, but the way I heard the way Bob taught it, the students um, rebelled and said, "We are not going to have religion anywhere on this campus, and we don't care whether you're Robert Thurman and whether you know." Forty years later, you'll be immensely famous, and we would, we'd wish that you, the center was on campus. You know, I mean, it's now um, Columbia. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Tough luck for us. Um, but I was going to say, in answer to that, I, my first question was 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 going to be to ask you what you would like to see, and I think you you, mm. you said that a little bit. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. But I guess the, the way I the, what I heard the three of us say um, is um, either you know. I, ho I hope that my teaching, and I think this is what Jim and Sue said too, is inhabits a place between the, you know, believer on board with the program and the like non-believer get this crap out of my face. Because there it says, you know what, it's not a question of belief or not belief. It's a question of 
is this thing important and is it interesting? And what's, you know, it's a, it's a question of like being able to, and I think all of us, I think this is what scholarship is. It doesn't just have, you know, I don't think that we're unique in being able to do this. I don't think, you know, I'm sure you all do this too, but to try to inhabit that position and to say, what would it mean to, to live in this text and how would it work? And if you do that, then, and, and if everybody's willing to do that on a, in a scholarly way and maybe also in a, you know, a more general way, then I think that skirts the problem of are you a believer or are you not a believer. This is an interesting text. I mean, I remember when I was, when I actually, I went to this Catholic high school, I was raised to Lutheran, and, and, um, and we were, you know, the first couple of years of theology was were, were this required course. And I thought it was absolutely fantastic, because it was just, it was just reading the Bible. And um, I wasn't at all, at that point, I had pretty, pretty, sort of fallen away, but I was still going through the motions. But um, I thought it was just, it's, I mean, that, that is a fantastic literary and philosophical and religious text, and just to be able to do it. And then the third and fourth years were like, you know, techniques of Catholic prayer, and I said, like, can I, like, take, you know, history of India instead, you know, which is what I did. But, um, but it was like, but, you know, there, who, who would not be interested in, like, in the Quran, in the Hebrew Bible, you know, in the Upanishads, in the, you know, great Buddhist, you know? Like, just as, like, a living human being interested in understanding stuff, you know? Who said you've got to be something to read it and care about it? It just seems yeah, totally clear. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to say we don't believe in a supernatural being who creates the world at a specific point in time. Yeah. Or whatever, that's fine. But to imply that people who stuff or who spend right. centuries reading it were stupid is dumb. Yeah, you know, right. so much to tell kids to shut up or grow up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, then, uh, the, yeah. the literary art that goes into the Hebrew yeah. Bible Absolutely. or the Quran mm -hmm. or what have you, and the sense of interpretation, you know, the Talmudic interpretation of the Bible, yeah. medieval scholastic philosophy in <clears> the Catholic Church. The great Protestant tradition of reading and interpreting the Bible—you know—that is that is amazing scholarship. I know there's smarter people than anyone in this place will ever be. So, yeah, uh, you know, a little bit of humility is good sometimes. But when you're 20 years old, everyone else is stupid. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, that goes with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Anyway, do you, uh, would you have further, th further thoughts on like what you would like to see it? And, like, you know, if, yeah. I mean, I feel like I work for the spiritual life office, yeah. and so I feel like that is one avenue that we try to outreach to the community just to have like some type of base of understanding. Mm -hmm. Like not just like, you don't need to believe mm -hmm. or you don't need to like, just a basic understanding of humans. Mm -hmm. And so we can relate to each other more. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I feel like in a classroom environment, I would just really expect more complete understanding from other students. I mean, going off of what you're saying is how can we sit here at 20 years old and just be like, everyone who's read this for centuries yeah. is stupid. Like, this is Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 contradict each other. Like, yeah. how can we read yeah. this? I didn't notice that. Yeah, it took a few thousand years and never occurred to them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's just like, I guess it's, it's just like a very broad thing, but like, I just wish people would be more understanding and more respectful of that. Like, how do I, as a student, sit there and be like, you shouldn't say that because it's disrespectful. How do you not know that there is someone who follows that faith in this classroom? Right. But then it's also like, am I going to take on that role every single time I'm in a classroom? No, that's yeah. interesting. So I mean, I just, just I wanted to, just to, with regard to that, I, I, um, see, I would, I, as a teacher and as a scholar, I'd be wary of steering away from those. So for example, looking at, you know, the, what are sometimes called like the two creation stories. Like, I think it's important to point that out and to think about it and to think, First of all, about how they might actually be consistent with one another, right. and secondly, how maybe these are what scholars say derived from different kinds of sources and mm -hmm. pieces. You know, all of those things are interesting. And I, if I were to say that, for example, and a believer, you know, mm -hmm. um, were to be worried about that, I guess that's where my my scholarly sensibilities would trump my. I would sort of say, this is still what we have to do in this class. And I'm not disrespecting the text. I mean, in fact, I'm respecting it. Sometimes a little bit, maybe even more than the believer does, because I'm willing to say, let's read it really carefully, care really carefully. You know, I mean, believe me, you know, I like I spent years reading, you know, the Gospels, and I had no idea. And then when I was at the University of Chicago teaching this core course, and I had to teach Matthew, it was like, man, this is cool and weird, and you know, like, <laughs> like let's look at it. You know, I mean, reading it on Sunday is like somebody like, you know, and I don't. 
you know, that's a different kind of way of inhabiting the text, and that's fine, and people do that. But in the classroom, like, we have an and this is what, this is what Talmudic scholars have done, this is what theologians have done, you know. I mean, they're reading it. Yeah. So, I would hope that that would be respectful enough of the text to not have somebody who was a believer think that, you know, that close analysis was dismissive. I also think that, again, there's been huge changes, and, and we've got a long way to go, but we're headed in, in a much better direction. The fact that you work for the spiritual life science. <laughs> there's a long history of the creation of that center, and there was a lot of animosity against it for, for many years. And, um, and I think that once, once the environment was right and it was created and, and we got good people in there who began to do the outreach and we got students who really flocked there, who, who wanted it, who needed it, and, and gave it life, that that has gone a long way in starting to change, but not everybody is attracted to it. Not everybody comes to the events that it sponsors. And, uh, and I also was involved in the intergroup dialogue facilitations that happen for a, a couple of years that periodically show up again, but I was in the first cohort. And um, yeah, and, and I was involved in running one about religion. And there were some, some staff members who said, you know, I feel like I can't even put anything in my office. I'm told by my boss I can't put anything religious in my office um, because she was Christian. But she felt like if she was Buddhist or something else, that she could have something in there and that would be okay. So even on the staff, there was, and, but this woman apparently was specifically told not to have anything religious visible in her office. And that was quite disturbing. That was only about two years ago. That's, that's disturbing. Mm -hmm. Do you need anything? No, no. I, can I just make, I was going to make one more. Um, well, why don't you ask your question? I'll put it down. Oh, it's actually um, yeah. kind of a comment um, yeah. living off of this, I know Hampshire and Rome, um, and I'm, you know, I haven't, I was at Hampshire, obviously, I'm in other colleges, but I guess when I went to school, I never expected a very respectful environment in um, terms of discussing religion, um, especially from a philosophical or historical perspective, and so, um, you know, I kind of thought if I wanted to be able to understand my own, reconcile my own religion, to really understand the text, I would need to go to a great extent, it would take a long time to really understand the text and the historical background enough to figure out, okay, well, how do I actually feel about that? But then I ended up studying um, political Islam, and I really found the um, faculty here, and also saw them at, um, at Amherst College, the way they studied the anthropology of religion was totally um, unexpected for me, and I mean, the focus on practice and the agency that people in a religion that we consider, um, you know, patriarchal and oppressive of women, and so many fascinating ways you can see that people are actually being agents in how they carry out their religion in ways that are even offensive to a Western feminist. So I thought that um, the way that that was approached here was actually very, um, very strong and and very interesting, and in that it wasn't um, some classes, for instance, on Islam might focus on just on the text itself, and there's some problems in the text, and um, I don't mean problems in the text itself, but I mean in the way that we from the West understand them, but the way people are actually focusing on looking at what people actually do and honoring that and not just saying, well, we can understand Islam by reading the Quran. Um, I thought that was really good here. So. I can give an example, too. For example, I've been building what Christoph saying, too. You know, there's a passage in the, in, the, in the Bible where God is going to visit the, the, the sins onto the seventh generation. Mm -hmm. And so the typical thing, of course, is evil, the Old Testament, cruel, vengeful God. Mm -hmm. That's not how it's interpreted. It was in Europe. It says what it says. Who knows what it meant? Nobody had an idea. But the way it's interpreted is that's God's mercy. Rather than visiting all the punishment of the guilty, he's going to spread it's it out. You know, he's going to soften the punishment. So you know, you've got to know the interpretive tradition. You yeah. can't just read these yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the court says you should stone the person to death for this. I mean, the Talmud said at some point, if a judge issued a single death warrant in so and so many years, he would consider an evil hanging judge. So, you know, there's no, the, the fact one talks about certain things where it says we're against this to the point of wanting to punish you with death, doesn't mean it was ever the case, you know. Some of these things are liberated vices or fictions, or lost in the midst of time, and, and again, things change. We were, um, not just in my, um, in my tutorial, we were reading the, uh, we 
in Genesis, and I, I wanted to read that Everett Fox translation, mm -hmm. which, is yeah. most, which is really interesting, partly because it just, it spins that text in a way that I wouldn't, especially with regard to gender, in ways that are, yeah. you know, really interesting. And, you know, he offers a scholarly reading of it. He's not like, you know, I am a feminist and therefore I'm going to. It's like, no, actually the Hebrew is much more mysterious when it comes to these things. Mm -hmm. so, Anyway, um, I was just—I was going to say one other thing, and it's so pointing out people in the room. I was thinking about Taylor. Um, um, I, one of the things I find that's really valuable um, about kind of a religious education um, or religious interest is that it, there's a kind of um, conceptual sophistication I think that comes from. Um, so I, I noticed, for example, when I teach courses, I often teach courses in metaphysics. You know, really kind of complex and really arcane. You know metaphysical systems. Um, and I often find that students who have either some religious interest or background have a much greater facility with that stuff <laughs> than, because they're used to dealing with very abstract stuff in very complicated kinds of ways. And students who come solely from the natural sciences where maybe I actually feel more ideologically aligned, sometimes they're really plotting because they're like, you know, it's just like it's if it's not mm -hmm. tangible and it's not visual, visible, then forget it. I mean, I was just thinking about Taylor who wrote some really, you know, interesting, um, did really interesting work on hugely hard in text that most people look, in the class looked at and like, I, I have no idea, <laughs> including me. So, it, was, it was new stuff to me. It was really super hard. But, um, but I noticed that, that a lot of students were really had a kind of like a facility, like a kind of conceptual facility that, mm -hmm. and, and that's really, again, whether or not you are a believer or whatever, that kind of education is usually important, I think. So it's usually with, you know, with, with um, some of the Buddhist texts. Um, yeah. Any questions for us? Yeah. <laughs> so you said in the Pioneer Valley, people have this romantic association for Buddhism. Um, do, do you think that's just because Buddhism is so far away, they're yeah. not close to the reality, as not as still, or as a reaction of the disillusionment with Christianity? I think, I think both. Mm -hmm. I think both. I think it's, um, it, it's far away, it's the other. I mean, in the United States, we really tend to exoticize the other right. in, in so many ways um, without understanding and unpacking that. And, um, and for many of the students, Buddhism is that way, especially when you have a figure like the Dalai Lama, who is, um, you know, brilliant politician, and how he's used the religion to get so much support around the world for his cause, um, because it was a very contained religion up until up until 1959, and he recognized and very astutely you know, sort of said, "Okay, I can get I can get support." With this, and and I'm not being I'm not being facetious about it because I actually really respect him, um, and he teaches. But I also think it was a brilliant political move. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that's very popular, and Tibetan causes are very very popular mm -hmm. in in the West. And it, it, there's a mystery about it that uh, appeals to people for that. Um, and then hopefully people then learn about it and get in more depth and see the complicated and, and, and start not having the reactions when you when you mention that they're Buddhists that go to war. Um, <laughs> that people don't get so shocked they say, oh yeah, well, you know, everybody has complications in, in life and has to make decisions. And what I mostly remember, well, I remember a bunch of things, but from his talk, was it 2008, was that, you know, he went on this like, I don't know, it was maybe 10 minute discussion of corporal punishment and why, yes. and why it's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, he, said, he said with that kind of smile, and yeah. sort of like, he said like, it's good to hit them. At least just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, like, I thought that was great. It was one of these things where, I mean, I'm not sure it's great to hit your kids, but I, but, but I, but I thought it was one of those things too, where like, this stuff is way more complicated. <laughs> He's been reincarnated a lot. No, like if you say Jesus came back from the dead, they said you're not supposed to be again and again, again, no problem. You know, we just have a free pass because the exoticism, I think. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, yeah. Something that a Christian could never say we take it seriously. Oh, yeah. And it is true across the board, I think. Yeah. yeah, and all our associations of, you know, Christian believers with, I don't know, with. You know, rednecks or right wing. You know, you know all this was, as you said, as Jim said, 
these things are much more complicated and we should probably attend to them. We should probably attend to you know, religion in the, in the late 20th, early 21st century as much as as much as previous. That's right, I know how to do it, but it's Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> I mean, you know, um, all these very fascinating books that have been written about the religion and politics, yeah, Amer yeah. American politics. I mean, you know, how do you understand the, the mm -hmm. American political landscape? I don't understand it. Right. You know, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you know, these are hugely important forces and that shape our political lives and like really, mm -hmm. really the Supreme Court, you know, like mm -hmm. like if you don't think religion plays a huge role in, in <laughs> what rights we're able to have and what rights corporations are able to have or whatever, you know. Anyway, that's a good Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see that course coming in another year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's gonna teach it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.